When David fought Goliath, all he needed was the memory of a victory from God to slay the giant. Like a stone in the sling, it was a testament of every time that God had fought for him. You see, David fought a bear, and then it died, and then David fought a lion, and it died, and because of him knowing the faithfulness of his God, he was able to step up to the giant and say, I see you, I know you, in the same way the bear came down, and in the same way the lion came down, in the same way you're coming down. This is the Slaying Giants podcast. Hey friends, welcome back to the Slaying Giants podcast. This is episode four. The Scandal of Grace, and today we will be talking about the story of Hosea, specifically about the story of Hosea and his wife Gomer. I feel like this is starting to become a repeating track for the last couple of episodes, but this was not the story that I intended on bringing you this week. However, this is the story God pushed me toward. When I posted the episode t- teaser this earlier this week, I said that this was going to be a deep episode. And indeed, it has already proven to be so. And while I tease that y'all wouldn't need floaties, I'm very serious when I say that I earnestly pray that you would open your heart and allow God to speak through his words this week. Sometimes it's so easy to read the Bible and to forget the weight of it. And I believe um, this week, especially for this episode, it's weighty and it's heavy. And I believe that God's desire is that we acknowledge that. Today, I watched a video that said, if you can leave God's presence unchanged, then you don't have a relationship. You have a hobby. And we like hobbies, don't we? We can pick them up and set them down when we want. We can stay amateur or we can choose to practice and become a professional. And I've been thinking a lot about that, especially since we just talked about it last week in David's story. The Israelites were content in just sitting on the mountainside. They didn't want to go or they didn't want to go into the valley. They didn't want to face Goliath. For the span of 40 days, they just stayed. In my own personal pursuit of deeper waters, of deeper faith, it's my desire that I never walk out of the church without encountering God and allowing him to change me in some way. It is my deepest desire that I never close my Bible or get up from prayer without God prompting change in my heart. Does it hurt when God chisels away at my heart? Absolutely it does. But it's so worth it to be able to reflect him just a little better to a world desperate to see him. Even if they don't know that he's what they're looking for yet. I hope sincerely that as we begin to go through this story that we can take a good look at our own hearts and our own walks and see the places where God is wanting to chisel away at. There's no desire whatsoever in me to hurt you in any way and I want you to know that I'm not here to condemn you or to convict you neither of those things are my job I'm just going to lay out the word that the Lord's given me and I trust that the Lord will handle the rest and I'm saying that because this week's episode it's it may be very weighty on you you may feel some conviction for it Um, just know that these episodes have to pass through my heart before they reach your ears. And they are as much, if not more for me than they are for you. So open up your hearts, ask God to let you receive what he's wanting to say. And it's my prayer that we can all walk away from this episode changed by God's presence and his glory. So let's get started. This week, our story takes place in a couple of chapters, and I may add a chapter or a verse later on in the episode, but we're going to start in Hosea 1 and read until the end of chapter 3. As usual, I will be in the ESV, but please feel free to follow along with your favorite version. The word of the Lord came to Hosea, the son of Barry, in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. And in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel. When the Lord first spoke through Hosea, the Lord said to Hosea, Go take yourself a wife of whoredom and have children of whoredom. For the land commits a great whoredom by forsaking the Lord. So he went and took Gomer, the daughter of the blame, and she conceived and bore him a son. 
And the Lord said to him, Call his name Jezreel, for in just a little while I will punish the house of Jehu for the blood of Jezreel, and I will put an end to the kingdom of the house of Israel. And on that day I will break the bow of Israel in the valley of Jezreel. And she conceived again and bore a daughter. And the Lord said to him, Call her name No Mercy, for I will no more have mercy on the house of Israel to forgive them at all. But I will have mercy on the house of Judah, and I will save them by the Lord their God. I will save them not by bow or by sword or by war or by horses or by horsemen. And when she had weaned No Mercy, she conceived and bore a son. And the Lord said, Call his name Not My People. For you are not my people, and I am not your God. Yet the number of the children of Israel shall be like sand of the sea, which cannot be measured or numbered. And in the place where it was said to them, you are not my people, it shall be said to them, children of the living God. And the children of Judah and the children of Israel shall be gathered together, and they shall appoint for themselves one head, and they shall go up from the land, for great shall be the day of Jezreel. Say to your brothers, you are my people, and to your sisters, you have received mercy. Plead with your mother, plead, for she is not my wife, and I am not her husband, that she put away her whoring from her face and her adultery from between her breasts, lest I strip her naked, and make her as in the day she was born, and make her like a wilderness, and make her like a parched land, and kill her with thirst." Upon her children also I will have no mercy, because they are children of whoredom. For their mother has played the whore, for she conceived them, has acted shamefully. For she said, I will go after my lovers, who give me my bread and my water, my wool and my flax, my oil and my drink. Therefore I will hedge her up. Or I will hedge up her way with thorns, and I will build a wall against her, so that she cannot find her paths. She shall pursue her lovers, but not overtake them. She shall seek them, but not find them. Then she will say, I will go and return to my first husband, for it was better for me then than now. And she did not know that it was I who gave her the grain, the wine, and the oil, and who lavished her with silver and gold that which they used for bail. Therefore, I will take back my grain in its time and my wine in its season, and I will take away my oil and my flax, which were to cover her nakedness. Now I will uncover her lewdness in the sight of her lovers, and no one shall rescue her out of my hand. And I will put an end to all her mirth, her feasts, her new moons, her Sabbaths, and all her appointed feasts. And I will lay waste her vines and her fig trees, of which she said, These are my wages which my lovers have given me. I will make them a forest, and the beasts of the field shall devour them. And I will punish her for the feast days of the bales, which she burned offerings to them, and adorned herself with ring and jewelry, and went after her lovers, and forgot me, declares the Lord. Therefore, behold, I will allure her, and bring her into the wilderness, and speak tenderly to her. And there I will give her her vineyards, and make the valley of Acre a door of hope. And there she shall answer, as in the days of her youth, as at the time when she came out of the land of Egypt. And in that day, declares the Lord, you will call me my husband, and no longer will you call me my bales. For I remove the names of the bales from her mouth, and they shall be remembered by name no more. And I will make for them a covenant on that day with the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens, and the creeping things of the ground. And I will abolish the bow the sword and war from the land, and I will make you lie down in safety, and I will betroth you to me forever. I will betroth you to me in righteousness and in justice, in steadfast love and in mercy, and I will betroth you to me in faithfulness, and you shall know the Lord. And in that day I will answer, declares the Lord, I will answer the heavens, and they shall answer the earth, and the earth shall answer the grain, the wine, and the oil, and they shall answer Jezreel, and I shall sow her for myself in the land, and I will have mercy on no mercy, and I will say to not my people, you are my people, and he shall say, you are my God. And the Lord said to me, go again, love a woman who is loved by another man and is an adulteress. Even as the Lord loves the children of Israel, though they turn to other gods and love the cakes of raisins. 
So I bought her for 15 shekels of silver and a homer and a leche of barley. And I said to her, you must dwell as mine for many days. You shall not play the whore or belong to another man. So will I also be to you. For the children of Israel shall dwell many days without a king or prince, without sacrifice or pillar, without ephod or household gods. Afterward, the children of Israel shall return and seek the Lord their God and David their king, and they shall come in fear to the Lord and to his goodness in the latter days. The story of the prophet Hosea is, to me personally, one of the most beautiful stories in the Bible. And maybe from the outside, maybe if you haven't heard the story before, you're thinking back to what I just read, and you're remembering the fact that I said whoredom like 17 times, and you're you're remembering the word naked, and God stripping, stripping people naked, and showing off lewdness, and you're like, what? And there's adultery in there, and there's lovers, and you're like, em. Ain't nothing about that story you just read beautiful. And all I can tell you guys is, hang on. This one isn't a surface level kind of story. This is one you've got to spend some time in. You've got to dig into it because not only is this a metaphorical story, it is also very literal. And just like last week with the story of David, there are so many things here to unpack. And there's so many things that I wanted to go into that we just didn't have time for or um, God just wouldn't let me go into those things. Um, there's so much symbolism in this story. Um, it's it's just so beautifully written. The poetry of the story is written. Um, it's just such a good story. I just there's so many things I wanted to cover that I just didn't get to cover in this episode. Um, because while this story is metaphorically about God and His unfaithful wife Israel, that's not the message that God gave me for today for you guys. So. This week, I'm going to encourage you right now to pull out your Bibles and to dive into that side of the story for yourself. Because the message that God gave to Hosea for Israel and its future is amazing. And I think it's something that we can take and glean information from and apply to our lives today. So, today though, today, God wants me to tell you the story of us, His church. The body of Christ, the bride of Christ, you and me. So please, please just open your heart up to receiving his word today. What I find so fascinating about Hosea's walk with the Lord is this. God asked him to put up or shut up. In so many words. Right off the bat in chapter 1, God speaks to Hosea and gives him a command and a calling. Like big deal though, right? You know, like everybody gets one of those, except... This is a very big deal because Hosea probably had an idea of how his life was going to go. When he was young, he probably was thinking about his future and he had an idea of the kind of woman that he would marry if he even married at all. And he had an idea of the kids that he would raise. And maybe he's even thought about what their names would be like, you know, um, names of his fathers or grandfathers or, you know, ancestors. And maybe even when he became a prophet, a man of God, he thought, "Uh, those things are probably not going to be for me as a man of God, you know. Um, And he kind of dismissed them. But God comes to Hosea and he hands him a heavy calling. And God's calling requires something of Hosea, something costly, his reputation and his trust. And you're like, what on earth has God called Hosea to do? Because he's already called him to be a prophet, right? God asked Hosea to go and find and to marry an adulterous woman, a lady of the streets, a woman who's known many lovers, a woman with a past. And this is such an incredibly big ask of Hosea because Hosea is a prophet. He's a man of God. For him to marry such a woman would not only be an insult to his character and to his devotion to God, but also it would be a risk to his reputation. And the places that Hosea would have to go to find such a woman were not places that a man of God should even be seen. It's a scandal. What God was asking Hosea to do was a scandal. Let's have a little fun here and imagine if your pastor was like single 
like single ready to mingle and he was like on a hunt for a new wife and you know all of like the church women are like trying to get their daughters ready to marry the pastor because you know he's cute um and all of a sudden like it's a week later after the the pastor's like oh god's told me i can take a wife and he comes in the next week married to a prostitute imagine the stir in the congregation imagine the whispers hmm Last week, she was in the streets, and this week, she's on the front pew. Hmm. Well, what has our pastor been doing to find a wife like her? Hmm. Gossip would spread like wildfire through the church because the very nature of this union is scandalous. And maybe it would be different if there was a true repentance before marriage. Maybe it would be okay if she had turned from her ways and started following God. But she's, Gomer is still living her life of sin when Hosea marries her. In fact, we know that Hosea is a mirror for God and Gomer is a mirror for Israel because it tells us that in chapter 1. Because we know that, we can go ahead and draw the connection that Hosea went out in search for Gomer. Like God told him to, right? He found her in the midst of her mess and offered to make an honest woman of her. Because that's what God does for each of us, right? He searches us out in our sin and shame. He wades through our muck and our mire, and he woos us. Just as when Jesus comes and begins to call us to him, we, like Gomer, have to choose whether we're going to accept and leave behind our lives of sin or ignore the call. When we accept Jesus' call and the gift of salvation, we are given a new life. Likewise, when Gomer agreed to be Hosea's wife, he took her from that life. He gave her his name. He gave her a home. He gave her a new purpose as a wife. And that change must have seemed like freedom to Gomer. At first. Because at first, everything is good. At first, Gomer is wooed by Jose. He speaks kindly to her. He treats her like a husband should treat his wife. He supplies for her needs. And we know this because Hosea is the mirror for God. He's not per perfect by any means. He's still just a man. But he is a good husband. And after some time, Gomer gets pregnant and she bears Hosea a son. And then something changes for Gomer. The novelty wears off. Routine sets in. And what once felt like freedom now feels like a cage. Maybe Hosea was too kind. Maybe he was too gentle. Maybe the routine of being the prophet's wife and being a mother, a mother were too heavy for Gomer. Because the word tells us that Gomer started slipping back into some old habits and started slipping into the beds of old lovers. And we can conclude this because of the terminology missing when we find Gomer pregnant again. Because this time, the word reads that she conceived again and she bore a daughter. The first time, she bore him a son. And we can also draw this conclusion because we are all the same. When we get saved, when Jesus delivers us from that bondage of sin, man, are we on fire for God. We could kick down walls. Yo, we're out there just, we, we get saved the next minute, you know, we're quitting every sin we ever knew, cold turkey. We don't even need no step program. We're just quitting. We're quitting everything. Praise the Lord. When we get saved, we're going to do anything for Jesus. He says, uh, you want a mission church to Zimbabwe? Absolutely. Put me on the next plane. I'll dig wells. I'll feed kids. I'll preach the gospel. I'll wash feet. I'll even clean the bathroom. Praise the Lord. I'll do anything for Jesus because we've got that fire in us. And it's kind of like me when I find a new hobby. And maybe some of y'all can relate to this. I have a love-hate relationship with new hobbies because, y'all, they become an obsession quickly. First, I'll just happen upon it, like a video, a picture, and I'm like, huh, that looks like fun, or I could make that, or I can do that, and that is where the downfall starts of my life, because then I start reading about it, I start watching videos about it, and I will read and watch everything that I can find about this new hobby, and then, once I'm confident that I know everything there is to know, I'll start researching the best tools for the hobby. And then I'll start researching the best place to buy the tools. And then after sometimes even weeks of all this research, 
I finally make the commitment and I buy the tools to start. And then the novelty wears off and burnout happens and all the tools that they're unused. And that's exactly what happens to us. Y'all, it starts small. We stop opening our Bibles every day. And then we stop spending time intentionally in prayer. And then we start to notice that we have these empty places in our heart that God used to fill for us. And instead of filling those places with what used to live there, God, we go back to our temporary pleasures. We give in to temptation and fall back on that old addiction, on that special secret sin. And we're so full of it. We're so full of ourselves. We tell ourselves that just one more time was... It's not going to hurt. It'll be fine. We tell ourselves that it'll fill us up like it used to. That this won't be just an empty well because we're thirsty. That we get over to the well and we draw up that bucket and y'all, isn't the bucket always full of mud? And we drink it anyway because we're thirsty and it doesn't quench the thirst. It doesn't fill those empty places in us or satisfy our hearts. And we do it again and again, looking for water to quench that thirst. But all we keep drawing is more mud. And we find ourselves sitting on the edge of the well with mud streaked down our faces, covered in shame. And we're forced to make a decision. We can keep pulling up buckets of mud. Or we can return home to God and repent of our sins and drink the good water again. And because Gomer is also a mirror for the Israelites, we know that she did this cycle with Hosea several times. She would be a good wife to Hosea for a while, and then she would go out on him. Rebel, return, repent. It was a cycle that the Israelites knew well and did with God all throughout the Old Testament. And if we're honest, it's something that we're guilty of too. We try to live good for God, and then we get tired, or we don't see the results that we want to see. And we go out and live life how we want. We fall into our old habits for a while. Until God does something to get our attention and then we run back to him and repent only to repeat the cycle again. And for Gomer, this keeps happening until the day she doesn't come back home. While we don't know the amount of time that passes, we do know that it's enough time for God to tell Hosea to go after her and find her. So again, Hosea goes back out on those streets. He goes back to those places he shouldn't be in in search for his wife. And what Hosea doesn't know yet is this. Gomer has woven herself so deeply in her sin this time that she can no longer get herself out. She's toyed with the shackles so many times that they finally closed around her wrists. And suddenly what was a fun escape has taken a turn and now she's a slave. And because of the choices that she's made, the consequences of those choices is that she has given herself into slavery willingly. And before we can be too hard on Gomer, I want to remind you that Gomer is us. Gomer is a mirror for us. We are Gomer, fickle and forgetful. What Gomer has done to Hosea, we do to God almost every single day. God saves us from the muck and the mire. He rescues us from the chains of our sins. And we do we not run back to them and reattach the shackles to our own wrists? Are we not the ones who run and sell ourselves back into slavery? This There's a reason that God mentions Egypt in chapter 2 of this story. And it's, it's a reason that the Israelites would have recognized. God freed them from the chains of their bondage in Egypt. He led them out of Egypt triumphantly parted a sea for them and let them walk across on dry ground so dry that they don't even get any mud on their shoes from crossing the sea which is crazy right crazy and as soon as things get a little difficult the Israelites start to whine and complain to Moses that it was better that they were slaves in Egypt because at least there they still had bread y'all how twisted is that but don't we do the same thing to God We ask God to deliver us and to provide for us, to take the wheel, to be the captain of our lives. And he does. But the second things don't go the way we want them to go, we tell God the same thing. And I've realized it's because it's a lot easier to wear the chains you know than to walk boldly into the unknown of God's freedom. Just let that one simmer on your heart for a minute. So 
Gomer finds herself in chains. And suddenly this isn't fun anymore. Suddenly this is scary and painful. And I would imagine that she's thinking about how good life with Hosea was. I would imagine she's longing for his gentle touch as opposed to the rough ones that she's feeling now. Y'all, can you imagine the guilt, the shame that she wore, which honestly was probably the only thing that she was wearing? I can. I can imagine it because I've left God and I've chased after my own lusts and desires. I've gotten myself in over my head with no way out. I have clacked the shackles closed around my own wrists and I've stood where Gomer is standing now. And this is how Hosea finds Gomer. Used, ashamed, broken, dirty. When I read this story, this is how I imagine chapter 3 went, just from my own understanding and knowledge of culture at the time. I always picture Hosea finding Gomer on an auction block, naked and in chains, waiting to be sold as property to one of the men in the crowd, waiting to be used again. And y'all, this part gives me goosies. Because maybe this wasn't her first time standing here. But it's about to be her last. Because Hosea steps into the scene, and it's a scandal. There is, this is no place for a prophet of God. And this is no place for the prophet's wife. But Hosea wasn't worried about his reputation. Hosea was here to get his wife and bring her back home. And I always imagine Gomer's eyes on her feet in shame. Because y'all, that's exactly where mom would be if I was in her place. And I can imagine her disbelief turned into horror as she heard a familiar voice in the crowd. I like to imagine that Hosea spoke up to the, the person auctioning his wife off and says, Excuse me, sir, that's my wife. Whether he did or not, we'll never know. This is all just speculation. But y'all... Can't you feel the embarrassment from Gomer as she found Hosea in the crowd, met his eyes, and felt his sadness? I wonder if she shook her head, if she tried to signal for him to leave, to save him from any more embarrassment, because I feel like there is a part of Gomer that realizes she's the one who's got herself in this situation. It's not Hosea's fault. Hosea has been nothing but a good and kind husband to her. She's the one who wasn't satisfied. She was the one who wanted more. She was the one who went out searching for it. And now look at this mess that she's got her in. And I only imagine that Hosea can see these thoughts running across her face. And this only causes Hosea to raise his voice and say it again. Sir. That's my wife. To which the man selling her probably just responded, Listen, dude, if you want her, you've got to pay. And while this bit of storytelling is, you know, merely just a guess, merely speculation, we do know for a fact that Homer did, or that Gomer did belong to someone because Hosea bought her back. He paid 15 shekels of silver and 700 pounds of barley. And if you're anything like me, you wanted to know exactly what the monetary equivalent of 700 pounds of barley was so i looked it up a bushel and a half of barley 700 pounds of barley which is what hosea paid was worth 15 shekels of silver so hosea bought gomer back for himself for 30 pieces of silver the same price that judas sold jesus for y'all the bible it's so good. It is so good. These are little pieces of gold that you have to dig for, but they are 100% worth digging for. Open up your bowels. Oh, gosh. So then once I figured that out, once I've made this connection, I'm getting really excited. I'm like, okay, that's great. I love that. I love that 30 pieces of, shekel, or pieces of silver. I love the 30 shekels. Um, that's all great. But now that I know how much he paid... I wanted to know how much 30 silver shekels were worth. And y'all, half a year's wages. So Hosea is here to buy back his wife. She's already his, but by her sin, she enslaved herself to others. And he had to pay half a year's wages to get back what was already his by covenant. Y'all. Redemption is costly. 
not only was there a sacrifice monetarily to redeem Gomer, there was also a sacrifice of reputation to redeem her. And in this time, in this culture, we talked about this um, in the Prodigal Son episode, a man's honor and reputation were everything. Remember the son's father shaming himself by exposing his legs and running through the streets. Guys, just as Hosea paid to ransom back his own wife, so also does God do for us. He created us, and we are his to do with as he pleases. And yet, when we ran off and enslaved ourselves to sin, he bought us back at the cost of the life of his son. And if that is not enough for you, let's find our red thread and tie this story to Jesus and wrap it up. I've shared several of the red threads already, so many of these may feel like a recap. It's great. That'll just that'll just help them stick better in your brain. So there are two different sets of mirrors in this story. In Israel's story, Hosea is the mirror for God, and Gomer is a mirror for the Israelites. In our story, Hosea is a mirror for Jesus, and Gomer is a mirror for us. And I honestly think that if you read the book of Hosea, many of the warnings that God gave for Israel can also be applied to us in the days and times that we're living in. Just as Hosea sought out Gomer, so also does Jesus seek us out and knocks on the door of our heart, holding the gift of redemption and new life. Just as Gomer turned back to old lovers, so also do we often lose sight of Jesus' goodness and faithfulness and chase after our old sins. We, like Gomer, are fickle and forgetful. We've forgotten what God has saved us from. And our fickle hearts chase the first glittery thing that turns our heads. We, like Gomer, keep drawing from empty wells and try to satisfy ourselves with mud when Jesus is freely offering us living water by the bucketfuls. But thankfully, like Hosea, Jesus doesn't give up on us. He seeks us out. He finds us in our mess, and he pays the cost to redeem us. For Hosea, it was only his reputation and half a year's wages. But y'all, Jesus laid down his own life for us and drank the cup of God's wrath to redeem us. I'm going to read a verse again from chapter 2. Because I have one more thing that is burning inside of me to talk about before we end this episode today. And this is going to be verse 14 of chapter 2. Therefore, behold, I will allure her and bring her into the wilderness and speak tenderly to her. God is talking about Israel here, but he's also talking about us. He says he's going to allure her and bring her into the wilderness and speak tenderly to her. And y'all, the poetry, but also the depth. God was going to lead them into the, to the wilderness to separate the Israelites from the idols and false gods. He was leading them into the wilderness to create some distance between him and the sins they kept running back to. And the more God just like kept laying this thought on my heart, the more I kept thinking about the choice of swimming out to the deep and staying in the shallow end. We talked about this a little last week with David. So hopefully you're still a little bit familiar with this um, concept of the deep end and the shallow end of faith. Guys, we can stay in the shallow end. We're allowed. God isn't going to drag us out to deeper waters if we don't want to go. We can go to church on Sunday and sing the songs and then leave church and never open our Bible through the week and live life how we want. That's allowed. God can be our hobby. That's allowed. We have free will. We get to make the choice. But this is what God showed me today about the shallow end. And it's weighty. Do y'all know why we love the shallow end? Because we're, when we're standing there, when we're standing in the shallow, we can return to the shore whenever we want. It's easy. It's only a few steps. We can turn around and return to our old sins as quickly as we would like. We can go and find our idols and worship them the way that we want and when we want to worship them. Because that's what our sins are, guys. Idols. Anything we put in front of God, idol. Do you all realize that God wants more for us than just getting into heaven? 
that he can't do anything if we're standing in the shallows. He's literally painting sunrises and arranging stars into constellations just for you. He's begging you to open your Bible. He's begging for you to seek his heart for yourself. He's begging you to stop relying on your parents' God or your pastor's God or even my God. He's begging you to stop relying on somebody else's interpretation of who he is and actually seek him out for yourself. Guys, here's the thing that I love about God. He's terrible at hide and seek because the second he sees you start legitimately searching for him, he can't help himself but show you who he is. So often I hear people say, I just can't wait to be with Jesus in heaven. It's going to be so good when we're up there with Jesus in heaven. And y'all, I get that. Like, heaven is going to be so good. But do you realize that you can live with Jesus right now? You don't have to wait. Yes, he saved you. He's given you new life. But y'all, there is so much more you could be trusted with. And in the days and times that we're living in now, there is no time more important than right now to be trusted with more. Y'all, he's calling you to the deep. It's okay if you're not a strong swimmer. He'll teach you on the way. You don't have to worry about drowning. Just like when Jesus called Peter out onto the waves, Peter got scared and started to sink. And the Bible tells us that immediately, Jesus reached a hold of him and saved him from the waves. Rest assured, he caught or he cares about you just the same. Y'all, the caller is the keeper. If he calls you to the deep, he'll keep you from drowning out there. The only warning I'm going to give you about swimming to the deep end and choosing to live that life is this. The further out you go, the less you can take with you. So be assured that there is going to be a lot of refinement and a lot of things are going to get burned up and it's going to be okay because they're not things that you needed anyway. There's going to be a lot of areas in your life that God's going to have to work on and that's okay because he is making you into a better reflection of who he is. The further out you go, the less crowded the water is going to be. And this one is going to be hard and it's going to hurt because there are going to be people that you love so much and they you want them to be on this journey with you and you want them to be swimming to the deep with you and you're wanting to share what God's showing you and they're just not going to be interested. They're content with the God that they have. They're content with the minimum that they have to put in and you can't judge them for that. You just have to let them seek God for themselves. You can't pull them out to the, to the deep end. You have to leave them in the shallow if that's where they want to stay. And that part's going to be hard. And the further out you go, the bigger the storm's waves are going to sink. Because the second you get out into the deep end and God starts revealing himself to you and you start um, doing what he's called you to do, the devil ain't going to like that. That is going to get him a matter and a hornet. And he's going to try and shut that down. So he's going to come at you with whatever, whatever weapons he's got to come at you with. But know that Jesus isn't going to let you drown out there. Because the farther out you go, the more intimately you're going to know the heart of the creator. And for me, that reward outweighs the risks. The choice is yours alone to make. Will you stay in the shallows or will you air up your floaties, put on your nose plug, and abandon the safety of the shore for the deep? He who calls you will keep you, sweet friend. See you next time.